Great. Hey everyone, welcome to Lunch Break. I'm Carrie. Today we're talking with Jody Rash. Jody is a New York based painter inspired by the images and metaphors of science. His work explores dualities, including, including science and mysticism, the unseen and the seen, and are based on electron microscopy, particle accelerators, and radio astronomy. His work also appeared in our exhibit, Embodied. So we're so happy to have you here today, Jody. Um, we'll also be doing a Q&A portion with questions from the audience. So if you have questions throughout the talk, you can send those in through the Q&A chat box. So can you just start off by giving us an overview of your work? Sure. So uh, thank you, Carrie, and thanks SciArt for inviting me to present. Um, so I've been uh, an artist for, I don't know, I started painting in uh, 1983, so it's been quite a while. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I painted, uh, when I first started painting, it was more traditional, things like landscapes, still lifes, things like that. And I, I always enjoyed the, the process of, uh, of painting. Uh, but after painting for a few years, it was a subject matter that just didn't inspire me. I got to a point where I thought, uh, does the world re really need another painting of a tree? <laughs> and my decision was uh, not for me. So I started thinking and exploring, what is it that interests me? And at the time I was reading, uh, the, uh, I was reading books about physics and particularly quantum physics. And the concept of quantum physics really interested me. Uh, there are all these concepts of, uh, of observer created reality about duality where a particle can be both, uh, an electron can be both a wave and a particle and other concepts that, that just seem more philosophy than, than science. So I was trying to, figure out a way of incorporating this into my artwork. And the first, um, the first science topic that I went into was actually physics. And if you can see the screen now, you can see uh, a, a stylized version of one of, my, uh, one of my paintings. But what that is, it's, a, um, it's from a particle accelerator, what they call a bubble chamber, where they collide the atoms together and depending on the, sh the spin, and actually I can go to some of the ones here. This is a, one of the early ones that I did. You can see, depending on which way the particle curves or if it goes straight, it tells you a lot about the particle, whether it's charged or not charged, uh, what its mass is and so on. And so to be able to show the actual science as well as, um, getting into the concepts. I don't know, it's not as clear on this one as one of the other ones like this, where initially I would put a lot of the concepts of physics in the work as well. So the idea of com uh, quantum reality, wave particle duality, to put those right into the pieces themselves. Then I decided to get a little more subtle, and this is uh, the image I was right up front. This is uh, also uh, from a particle accelerator, but if you look in kind of the lower part on the right, rather than having the words, what I did is I took some of the formulas. Mm -hmm. So this is uh, the formula for Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. So that uh, you can never know two things with certainty about a particle. And when I look to what I want to put in the, the uh, paintings, I look for not just its relationship to science, but its relationship to the greater world as well. So I just thought the whole concept of uncertainty, that we can never be certain about different facts, particularly two different things at one time, had a, a more global uh, reach and, and concept to that as well. And I, I probably would still be doing particle physics if, um, if they hadn't changed the technology. It went to a much more computer-based technology which was great for the science, but really bad for the art because it just didn't have the same aesthetic as, uh, as I was looking for. So I started looking for other areas that I could express the, this concept. So one of them, I then moved to astronomy because astronomy has a lot of uh, the physics of it as well. 
So this was a, 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 a painting that I did. This is um, on, on board, it's acrylic on board. And uh, this is, the, the title of this piece is uh, The Four Seasons of Dark Matter. Uh, dark matter makes up 85% of the matter in the universe, but we can't see it. And I just thought the idea of painting something you couldn't see was an interesting thing to do and an interesting concept. This was uh, based on images from a telescope in Hawaii, so it's an Earth-based telescope. And even though we can't see uh, dark matter, it has an effect on, uh, on visible matter. Uh, it, the only real impact that we can detect is uh, its gravitational effect. So even though you can't see the dark matter, you can infer where it is and kind of take a negative image of that. And so painting something that you couldn't see was, was interesting. And, and I'll stop here also to kind of talk a little bit about technique and how my technique has, has uh, grown over the years. The first thing with this is you notice that there's a lot of gold in this image and, and in a number of others that, uh, that I do. And if you look at uh, the, kind of, uh, the paintings in the Middle Ages, you would always have these gold halos around religious uh, figures. And I tried to take that gold, that concept of the gold uh, and the religion, as in their times, religion is what people fall back to to explain the way the world works. So the use of the gold in my uh, work is showing that, the, that science is now taking over from uh, religion as a way we explain mm -hmm. the world. In addition to that, a lot of the technique I pull from uh, the Impressionists. If you look very carefully here, there, and some others, you'll see this technique in different formats as well. But even though the, the final piece may be very large, it's typically made up of very small brush strokes or uh, sometimes I'll use uh, color pencil. I'm gonna show you a piece later that's uh, graphite and it's also very small pieces. So I like the technique of the uh, pointillist. So this isn't really pointillism, but that was an inspiration for, uh, for what I did. This is a uh, work on paper uh, called uh, Einstein's Cross. Uh, given Einstein's theory of relativity, what he, um, what, what Einstein's theory of relativity uh, says is that massive objects warp space time. And if you have a light that passes through this warp, it acts as a lens, so something called a gravitational lens and it breaks it up into multiple images. So what this actually shows is multiple images of the same object, probably a quasar. And again, there's the gold as part of the theme, and then the cross, which also brings a concept of science taking over for religion into this piece as well. And this piece is just a work on paper. Uh, it's fairly large, I, I forget the exact dimensions, but probably about uh, 50 inches by 60. And again, it's all very small uh, pencil marks within this. And is that derived from, uh, from a picture? Yeah, so everything that I do, the, the basis for it is an actual image. Okay. Uh, for most of them, I don't bother to stick with the actual colors because, for example, in radio telescopes, there, a lot of the images are taking frequencies that are invisible to the human eye. So they'd be x-rays or, or even uh, higher up in the spectrum. So they're all false color anyway. So uh, mm -hmm. changing the colors is really not uh, a problem. And also with the biology that I'll show you later, uh, same type of thing. Uh, in addition, uh, you know, I, I want to keep some of the main elements constant, but particularly the backgrounds are not, I don't, I don't, I don't feel as much uh, loyalty to the backgrounds. And what I try to do is create patterns within patterns with this as well. 
So there's a lot of artistic license taken with this, but the core shapes and elements should be consistent. This is an image also, it was on four uh, panels of uh, paper, 22 by 30, I believe, and this is a galaxy. Uh, this is one of the, my earlier pieces. Uh, and again, you can see small dots that eventually fade out. Uh, and I believe in case any of you want to look this up, I believe this is galaxy M52, which shows a main galaxy and then kind of over to the right is a galaxy that it is pulling into it and destroying over, over time. Uh, one of the other, th uh, this is actually a part of a, this is also about 100 inches long by 50 high and it's one uh, part of a neutron star. And this is acrylic also on, uh, on paper. Uh, and again, it has that pointillism technique, although just in, in the black and white. Uh, the kind of, I would say the, the theme that I've done the most work in lately is in biology. Uh, and I try to do this in certain themes. So this, this is a theme where it was white blood cells. I'd started out doing a lot with viruses and bacteria and I tended to use very deadly ones, one of which was the bubonic plague, and uh, I, I did an HIV and uh, malaria and others as well. And the reason by, behind those is that they, the images were, were beautiful, but the actual organisms were very deadly. So that duality I always thought was very interesting. Well, after doing that for a number of years, I kind of felt, I needed to do some healing. So I switched and I was, did a series on healing, one of which was uh, actually the next two slides are gonna show that, uh, were white blood cells, because they are what actually heals our body. And that also has that higher concept of healing society. Interestingly, well, at least I think so, uh, the first one on the, uh, well, I guess on the left, uh, when I was looking at what color schemes to use with that, was very attracted to one of my, the artists that I actually will like quite a bit is Gustav Klimt. And I tried to take some of the color schemes that uh, he used in, in some of his, uh, his paintings, and he also uses a lot of gold in his as well, and translate that into, uh, into the images that I was using. And there's a little bit of the dancers and Miro dancers going on here as well, which I thought was interesting. <laughs> Uh, these are uh, blood clotting at different stages. So from the left to right are very early stages, but again, you know, going into the pointillism and the concept of the healing that, um, that I presented throughout this. Just going to a couple of others. Uh, this is a series on the brain. So this is based on an MRI. So the, this is our series th uh, called Thought. And this is another one from that series. Uh, this one, each of these squares is six inches by six inches. And I believe there are 100 of these squares that wow. we put together and then had to attach together. So that's a project I never want to do again. But it was <laughs> interesting to do once. And then there are just certain things that I find interesting, uh, try to step outside of what I traditionally do. So this is uh, from uh, the spectrum, element spectrums. So when you excite an element, and this is uh, the top one is oxygen, uh, you get it to, uh, the whole idea of light is it's quantized. So it will create, that's what creates the spectrum. And depending on where the dark lines are on the spectrum, you can tell what element it is. So that's how they can tell that a planet has a certain amount of hydrogen or nitrogen and all that. This was done as the totem. So these are the two sides of it. The top is uh, oxygen and the bottom is actually hydrogen. As you notice in the middle, the pattern repeats. So it's actually two hydrogens. So this is basically water, hydrogen, two hydrogens and, and oxygen. Uh, this was a, a, um, from a series uh, that I called initial conditions. So this pattern, this is actually an Excel spreadsheet that you're seeing now, if you can see very closely, 
you can see a series of uh, ones and twos. And what happened with this, uh, well, I thought ahead. So th this is what's in there from the Excel spreadsheet. And the, the first line is something that I came up with randomly in terms of ones and twos. But every line subsequent to that was based on this algorithm. So it's just basically telling you that uh, if it's if using this algorithm by adding the two boxes below it, if it creates something odd, you make it a one, and if it's even, it's a two, and if it's a one, the box is white, if it's two, the box is black, and that's how basically the pattern was created. And then I use the Excel spreadsheet, not knowing how when I first put this in, how it would develop. So the final thing I just want to show you is a piece that I just finished. It was a hydrogen atom. And just to show you the monotonous technique that's used, it's all very, very small circles that create patterns within patterns. You can see how much of the pencil is left there. This is very pencil intensive. And then the work itself is building up to this, I hope it looked impressive because it was a lot of work <laughs> to get to this stage. And whoops, and that's the final piece. And it was finally done. Wow. All right. So here is, if you want to get a more on the le my website, I have two websites. One is Rash Art, and the other is Laminar Project, which is a group of artists who use science. Uh, in, in their work and emails, both myself and the gentleman that I work with, Neil. So feel free to reach out. Okay. Wonderful. Thank Thanks you. so much. Yeah, I, I actually really am enjoying seeing your works together on this page. And I, I feel like the experience of being in person with them would be really interesting. Um, the work you were just talking about with the graph paper, was that created when you used the algorithm to create the pattern? Did you then make it by hand or was it printed by the computer? No, I did that by hand. What, okay. I, what I did is I had got graph paper and uh, in the graph paper, each square, I would put a circle in there, uh, whether so, and I used uh, acrylic markers for that. Uh, okay. Finally found a, brand of acrylic markers that doesn't constantly uh, give out. So that was, that was helpful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, no, it's all done. It's all done by hand. Okay. And in creating um, that algorithm, did, did you feel that was a different process or a different feel um, in your approach to creating work than your, than your paintings? It was in a way, in other ways it wasn't. So the concept that I was trying to explore was chaos theory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so to cr start creating random patterns uh, to see what happened. So, you know, it was different in that uh, I had never just kind of let the image create itself, which is what this one does. Uh, mm -hmm. But a lot of the technique of using small circles to build up a hole uh, is uh, is consistent with what I was doing before. So it's sort of like taking a, a new step. Yeah. Me. Yeah. And have you um, or will you go in that direction further, do you think? Well, the problem with that direction is if you notice that there's a lot of triangles in there. Uh -huh. And what I learned as I got more and more into this is that unless you use nonlinear equations, you tend to get a lot of triangles. Oh, so, uh, and then when you use nonlinear equations, then you get these interesting fractal patterns. But you know, fractals have been done so many times already that that doesn't interest me as much. So maybe uh, it was interesting to do, but I'm not sure how much I'll go back into that. Okay. And have you always worked on such a large scale? And what, what, is, what draws you to that? Well, I actually started doing some a mix of kind of small scale. I, I did a, quite a number of series that were very small. 
Okay. Uh, but those tend to be more intense. So they would be typically using the acrylic marker, but maybe on black paper. So you get this very intense feeling. I prefer to work very large uh, just because, you know, the, particularly when you're dealing with things like the physics and the biology, the reality of what you're dealing with is microscopic or even subatomic. Yeah. So to do that on a large scale, I like that duality and the juxtaposition of doing something like that. So right. the idea of changing scale and, and bringing something that's basically invisible to such a large scale, that is part of the concept behind the work. Yeah. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the process that goes into making one of your paintings, um, whether you do research before or what inspires you to move to a certain topic or a certain image? Well, it varies. Uh, sometimes it's a concept that I find interesting. Uh, like the last piece I did was actually the hydrogen atom. Uh, and so I thought it'd be really interesting to be able to do an image that was based on something like one of the smallest units of existence. Mm -hmm. But then a lot of times you look at the actual imagery and that's not that exciting. So to, so to join the, con the concept along with the imagery is really what you look for. So, you know, I'll look through a lot of science books or go to websites like the CDC or Fermi mm -hmm. Lab, or, you know, there are other, other ones as well to try to get some concepts. So for example, uh, you know, I wanted to do a series on, uh, on cancer. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, I look at actually one of the images on this site right here is uh, prostate cancer. Oh, wow. Right. So I did that and, you know, did uh, ovarian cancer, breast cancer, so to do that, just because, you know, it's just such a charge and emotional issue. And then the imagery from it, the, the electron microscope images are really fascinating with that. So, uh, so, you know, it's a combination. I come at it from a variety of different ways. After a certain while, you know, boredom go, comes into it as well. And that's why I was kind of looking at something different to do from the biology side, because I've just done so mm -hmm. many different versions of cells and things like that to take a break from that to kind of look at different things is uh, I need to do that from time to time. Yeah. When people see your art, is it important to you that they see the science behind it or know that it's based on science? I'm just thinking because the pieces are on their own are very beautiful um, and someone could look at it and not know at all what it's based on, but knowing that that painting is about prostate cancer brings a whole nother level to it. Yeah, so I don't care if people know what, uh, what the science is behind it. I mean, that's more, I do these because I want to explore mm -hmm. my mind and what my image is. And, and to the extent that you can communicate to people on a lot of different levels, uh, uh, that's fine. Uh, so if someone is interested in the internal patterns of the of the work, you know that's good enough. If they know the science behind it, you know that would be kind of the second level. Mm -hmm. The third level would be understanding at least my concept of how this relates to our broader world and our interactions with other people. And then the final level is kind of looking at all that, and then understanding how the painting techniques tie into historical. Uh, uh, the history of art. But one thing I thought was really interesting at a show, and I had one of the oil paintings I had done that was about HIV. Mm -hmm. And there was a guy who was looking at it and you know, liked it and asked me about it. And I told him it was HIV. And he actually took a step back oh. from the painting. Yeah. And I assured him you couldn't get it from an oil painting. But I think he walked away after that. So Wow. Different people have different reactions when they find the science behind it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's really interesting. And what you said before about um, when you were doing a series on viruses and then switching to doing a more healing process. I think that is also interesting. Did you feel like a, an impact from focusing so much 
on viruses? Yeah, you do, because, you know, regardless of the fact that, you know, you're taking images, the whole idea is to have an emotional reaction to the work. Mm -hmm. So the fact that I know what I'm painting is, you know, like the one, like this one here is Ebola. The fact that I know that that's what I'm painting, you know, it does have an impact on you. And when you're doing one right after another, you know, to break it up, to, you know, feel a little better, you go from HIV to uh, ovarian cancer, you know, it's, <laughs> you know you, at some point it was to me cathartic to switch to things that like the white blood cells, the blood clotting, it, it actually was cathartic for me to work on that. Mm -hmm. Have you um, been inspired to create any art around COVID? I have actually, I've done a number of images based on, at first I wasn't going to do it, because uh -huh. I, you know, it just seemed like it was, I don't know, too raw, too new. But then someone I know sent me the image of, I guess what they call patient one from China, the first uh, hmm. COVID virus. And again, you know, I was just drawn in because when you look at the virus itself, it's, it's quite beautiful. And so I relented and I did like a small one first and then kind of did a couple after that that were, were larger. And those are actually posted on the website if people are interested in looking. Oh, okay. Do you feel any conflict ever with presenting these viruses as such beautiful pieces? No, I, I think that's kind of the point, uh, like the larger point mm -hmm. is that we can see beauty in many different things. So bringing that from the biological to the social, I think that's an important thing to, uh, to consider, is how we can see beauty in things that may not appear that uh, on face value. Yeah, definitely. So what, um, is there anything you're working on or, or looking to create next? Well, the, the piece right behind me was kind of the latest series that I was w right. working on. Uh, called Sight, and it's the idea is for people to be aware and look rather at the world rather than just walking through that. So that's one. I I, I did the uh, uh, the hydrogen atom, and I was thinking about the next piece. Although I have to figure out how to do this, is that they also have images of black holes. So th the interesting thing about that is kind of the shape is similar to the atom. And again, it's looking at something that you can't see. So that's a concept I've been thinking about how to approach that. So stay tuned. Great. <laughs> well, we do have some questions in, so I'll turn it over to Julia for that. Sure. Hi everyone, this is Julia from Fire. Uh, Jody, thank you so much for sharing your work. It's really great to see what you've been up to lately. Um, I was telling uh, Carrie and Jody before we started broadcasting that Jody's work is really the kind of work you need to see in person to get the full effect. It's the, when he talks about, you know, having the gold incorporated, it's the, his pieces really glow and, and the scale of them are really powerful. So if you ever get a chance to see his work in person, I highly recommend it. Um, we were just talking about your hydrogen piece. We have a question in about how long it took you to make that work? Yeah, so it's always like, that's a question that everyone wants to know is like how long it takes you to make the work. You know, it, it's, it's hard to say because if you saw the technique of those small circles, I know this is hard to believe, but uh, there's only so long you can do that in a day before you start going crazy. So I don't know, I probably worked on that piece on and off for about a month. Uh, and okay. yeah, I would work maybe three, four hours a day on it. So yeah. uh, audio books are my best friend. <laughs> audio books are fantastic <laughs> for that kind uh, of work, especially. Um, this is a, a related question. We have a few people who are asking this. Um, how close are your pictures to the art that you make? Uh, how close are they visually to the actual atom or molecule or biological system um, that you're referencing? And what 
what systems do you employ to like maintain you know the integrity of the source imagery but carry it through to some sort of aesthetic output yeah so it is important to me that the the core of uh, of the image is is what the actual scientific image is uh because you know that's what my work is about it's it's uh the conceptual part of it has to do with uh not distorting the image but what the image represents so you know it's um you know there are various different ways to do that you know from creating your grid and drawing in the core elements of it uh, you know, you can use projections to be able to do it. Uh, there's now one thing that I'm kind of trying out called Camera Lucida, where it projects, but the, the typical Camera Lucida was using mirrors and all that. Well, of course, in this day and age, they now have an app for it. Uh, <laughs> it requires slightly longer arms than I've got right now, so there are techniques around that. But then, you know, that's just to get the, the general shapes and relationships with that. And there's obviously a lot of editing, not just in, you know, the placement of the, of the image and you know, what you see versus what's in frame and out of frame. You know, all that is subject to interpretation and particularly the technique and the colors that I use are all uh, subject to interpretation. Yeah, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the colors. I'm noticing we have on the screen now um, your painting on the top left of this grid has a visual similarity to the one that's behind you in terms of your color choices and even the shapes that are happening. Right. And is that because kind of you're going back to bi biological type things? Do you feel like you have different color palettes for different strains of your work? Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to gravitate to certain colors. So, uh, and, you know, the blues and the golds are, uh, and different shades of the blues tend to be what I find most interesting. So, as a result, every now and then I will hide those colors and force myself to <laughs> use the different colors. If you look at the lower left, that was one of those times, you know, that's more like the greens and uh, more of a green palette to it with that. Uh, so, you know, like with anything else, there's certain things that, you know, I just like the kind of the calmness of the blues and the, the gold is important to me just because of the symbolism of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, I don't want to just fall into the pattern of always using the same colors either. <laughs> Everyone has their own kind of, you know, internal preferences, which manifest themselves. Um, uh, we have one comment and question. I love how you have created artwork based on duality. Have you considered showing empathy in the brain and how this part of the brain changes when nurtured or, you know, is, is interacted with? So things relating to maybe different structures of the brain. I know right now you're doing one on the more visual part of the brain. Um, but yeah, any thoughts about exploring yeah, that? Yeah, actually, I've thought about that. You know, the question is how to go about doing that. Um, so what I thought about doing it was uh, I started doing a series of, with the uh, MRI. And there are images based on, well, the, there's like normal brains, abnormal brain. They'll do people's MRIs based on uh, different emotions and so on. So I was thinking about it, but the, the problem with that is that the, the core structures, at least from my standpoint, the core structures of the brain don't change as a result of that. What happens is that they tend to be more highlighted, but if I'm not using the actual colors, that kind of gets lost in the imagery. So if I can figure out a way to do it, I, I think it's an interesting concept. I just haven't yet figured out a way to incorporate that into the artwork. That makes sense. Yeah, and you know, maybe it's just a matter of you're waiting for technology to, to improve or, or do something new in the way that you stop making work about you know, certain types of physics because the technology change, maybe there will be a technology change in brain imaging, which will kind of open up new avenues for you and a lot of other artists. Um, That'll be good. Let's, 
let's see, I'm looking here at our list of questions. Um, a question about uh, your process. Do you work through collaborations or research independently or both? I'm a lone wolf. <laughs> no, I'll do my own research. And uh, I mean, I wouldn't, and actually uh, Sci, the Sci Art Initiative does a lot of these collaborations, which I think is great. Uh, depending, I think a lot of it depends on the type of art that you're doing as well, uh, in terms of whether collaboration works or not. Because, I mean, I won't say I'm not interested in the science, because obviously I am, but the point of the, my work isn't the science. It's the more of the social aspects behind it. So when I talk to kind of scientists about working together, I just find what I'm interested in and what they're interested in tend to diverge. Having said that, you know, if I found the right partner for it, I'd be happy to work with them. But so far it's been uh, just me doing the research and figuring out what I want to uh, what I want to work on. Yeah, and like you said, you know, there are these resources available online now where even if you're not part of the sciences professionally, you can go to the CDC website, you can find these, you know, vast, you know, stores of data online that are just open access. And it, it wasn't always like that. Did you, have you experienced, like, has it become easier to make work about different scientific subject matters as things have become very available online as opposed to, you mentioned you started making this work in 1983 when I imagine it was a little bit different? Yeah, well, it is. I mean, the copyright issues are obviously ones that I'm very, uh, very concerned with, very aware of. So there are a lot of sites like Fermilab, CDC, and others, particularly if it's government funding, those images tend to be uh, a free license. And even if you go to like a university and get their uh, images from those sites, uh, those are a lot of them are like black and white images. So, you know, what you create, you're allowed to create derivative works off of the scientific images. You can't take their image, reproduce it, and then sell it. But if you create a derivative work, depending on how similar it is and the fact that this is art and painting and all that, uh, it's different enough that it's really not a copyright infringement. I mean, the things that I never do is, you know, like Nikon will have their small world uh, competitions. And because yeah. the scientists doing that are not just reproducing the image, but they're doing it to create a work of art, I'll never use anything like that. I always say far away from that because they want to create art and I'm creating art and I don't want to steal their, their artwork. <laughs> Yeah, where where does science end and art begin? Um, in that Nikon competition, it's <laughs> hard to say sometimes. Um, but um, well, that that is all the time we have for questions today. I want to thank you so much again, Jody, for sharing your work with us. Um, a small announcement, only because you brought it up. We have an open call right now for art for a show called Culture of Contamination. Um, while we expect to get a lot of submissions related to COVID, contamination doesn't only relate to viruses, it relates to how ideas spread and how people spread and, um, and so on and so forth. So for everyone out there, I hope you consider submitting. We are happy to waive submission fees right now and maybe we'll see Jody's work in that show. Um, but anyways, just wanted to put that out there and Carrie, I will let you wrap us up. Great, thank you. It's been so wonderful to hear about your work and your process, Jody. So thank you so much. And thanks for everyone who joined us and for your questions. If you missed any part of this talk or you want to look back on it or share it with friends, it will be posted on our YouTube page, um, which we'll be sharing soon on our social media. You can go to our website at sciartinitiative.org to join our mailing list and stay up to date on everything we're doing. We're doing these lunch breaks every Wednesday at 1 p.m. So we hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.